Good morning, Berlin. Welcome. Welcome to the Academy Day. Oh, come on. Good morning. Good morning, Berlin. Come on. Make some noise. Yeah. Good morning. This is a day to have fun, to give you some orientation and inspiration that you know what's coming up in the future. You know, come on, let me be a little bit more excited. I, I know, you know what, you know what. We, who, who will be, the, be able to clap his hands and make a lot of noise, be the loudest, stamp the feet, screaming, clapping the hand? We have this wonderful T-shirt. It's a design T-shirt by Cisco. So again, yeah. welcome Berlin! Yeah. This guy, come on, a little bit. No. Oh. <laughs> so welcome. And uh, let me introduce you to this guy. His name is Karsten. Let me introduce you to this guy. His name is Karsten. So uh, to make it easy for you, your two moderators have the same name. But now, please start the show. Yeah, we also look a little bit similar, you know, from the dressing, from the hairstyle, from the weight. <clears throat> OK. So uh, good morning. It's great to have you here in Berlin. And um, I would like to, to get us started for an exciting day. And uh, we are going to talk about also global problem solvers. So um, good morning and welcome to the Academy Day. And um, maybe you might ask, hmm, because a lot of you are Germans. And you might ask, why is this strange guy talking in English to me? Because. I'm Bavarian. If I would talk to you in German, you wouldn't understand me. So this is the reason why I'm, I'm speaking in English. So talking about global problem solvers, this is our main topic of today. And global problem solvers would mean everyone of you could be a global problem solver. Isn't this the case, Carsten? I think so. There are many problems to be solved. So for example, we have some global problem solvers up here. I don't know these guys. Do you know these guys? Uh, maybe we can introduce you to, uh, I think the one on the right-hand side is maybe the most easy for you. It's in his young age. Who knows? Albert Einstein. Yes. OK, this was one. Uh, the second invented penicillin, so something what really solved the problem, Fleming. And the one in the middle, Karsten? It's, it's Röntgen. Uh, Mr. Röntgen, you know that you can see what's happening inside if you have broken your bones or someone. So it's good to know, you know, where you have to have a surgery and not that you get open on the right, on the wrong place. So, you know, this were some kind of what we call global problem solvers. But with all the technologies, what we have there, this enables us, every one of us, that could be a problem, a global problem solvers. So what we would like to inspire you today to become a global problem solvers. So every one of you could become a global problem solver. Now you might ask, you know, this guy is talking a lot. What does this mean to become a global problem solver? And for this, we are honored and proud to welcome on stage Giuseppe Cinque. He's leading the IoT technology uh, strategy from the Networking Academy program from Cisco to explain to you what does it mean to become a global problem solver. Welcome Thank on you. stage. Thank Zephyr. you very much. And, Thank you very much, Carson. Thank you. And, uh, and the last thing, the last thing, which is really important, if you like it, you know, if you like IT or if you like it, then make a lot of noise. And if you don't like it, make a lot of noise anyway. Thank you very much. Have a great presentation. Thank Thanks you, Carson. Thank, Thank you, Carson. Hand it over. So good morning, Berlin. It's such a pleasure to be here. Uh, so in the next 30 minutes, I would like to introduce several concepts. So I see a lot of smart brain in this room. And so I would like to start talking about the emerging technologies. I'm leading a small group inside Networking Academy that's dealing with new technology, how this technology changed the world, and now we need to prepare our students for this new technology. And uh, inside that, you may have heard the terms digi digitization or digital transformation. So let's look uh, a little bit into that. What does it mean? And then how innovation is changing? How innovation has been uh, transformed in the last 20 years? And what is happening in, this, in that field? And last but not least, we will talk about the global problem solver concept that we want to, uh, all of you to be a part of it. 
But before that, I have a tradition. This is uh, the thir the, my third academy day. We started in Milan uh, in 2014. And uh, the presentation was about um, teaching uh, what's happening behind the scene when you take a selfie. All the technology that are uh, working together to make the selfie happen, something that we used to do every day. And then we did it another presentation uh, the uh, next year about innovation and uh, how the selfie stick was a kind of innovation. So today, to keep the tradition, I need to take a selfie with you. So uh, I, I ask you to cheer a little bit. Let's see if the technology helps me. Yeah. <laughs> But now, this time, what I will do is I'm pushing this um, image on uh, Cisco Spark. Who is using Cisco Spark? Cisco Spark is a messaging system uh, that is in the cloud. So uh, now I'm sending this uh, picture into the cloud. And um, in this room, that is a chat room, actually there is a robot, a boat, that as you can see has already detected um, that in this image, there is people, audience, and there is joy. So congratulations <laughs> for having the joy. And how does this work? I mean, let's switch back to the PowerPoint. I think the image is still loading. So it works because uh, it has uh, an interconnection of several technology. So first of all, the mobile technology that allows me to take a picture wherever I be. And then there is the Spark, that is a communication cloud where I can send this picture. And uh, on the other side, there is a Google Vision that is a, an artificial intelligence cloud based on deep learning. Deep learning is an amazing algorithm that is making breakthrough in artificial intelligence. So that image is uh, taken and is analyzed compared to 15 billion pictures that have been taken all over the world. And from this comparison, the bot is able to understand what's in the picture. So there is an audience, there is a person, and the person is expressing joy. So this is one of the things that uh, you can do in a, a one day of coding, or one afternoon of coding, depends on your skills, using the API, so using existing block and putting them together. So you can imagine the same application for your door uh, to take a picture when a, a person uh, comes to your uh, door and send you a message on WhatsApp, for example, to say, oh, this person is at your door. You, you, you may want to go open your door or things like that. Um, so going back to the, the main topic, uh, interesting enough, I mean, the, the data is becoming so predominant that, for example, people are starting using it to infer uh, information about cities. This is a, a project called uh, Selfie Cities, where uh, uh, images are taken from different cities, from Instagram, and they are analyzed in terms of position of the face, expression of the face, uh, gender, age, and you, have, you can extract all the analytics of, uh, from this big data set. So if you want to play, you can go online and uh, filter by country, by uh, gender, by age, and uh, uh, extract from this big database. So this is one of example of the digi digital transformation, digitization. But what is this digitization, digi digital transformation? Quite frankly, the first time I heard that, I thought that the digital transformation has already happened. I remember where you were not born in the 80s, um, we were talking about becoming digital. It was about digitizing the music. So the, the first thing, before that, you cannot believe that, but that's way, the way we uh, were listening to the music. We were using a, a record where on the surface there were some uh, um, uh, things, uh, and this point was able to detect this uh, uh, imperfection and transform this in sound. This was not so much different of the <laughs> Fleeston age. And then we had uh, the CD-ROM that changed uh, everything. And at the same time, there was some illuminated uh, researcher at MIT, uh, Nicolas Negroponte, who started to see that different industry, the music industry, the video industry, and the computer industry, that were completely apart, were coming together. So the technology was making possible 
things that were in different industry uh, together. And with this graph, where the three different industry, motion picture, publishing, and computer industry as a separate uh, diagram, then converging, with this diagram, he founded the Meet Media Lab. And now it's for granted that media and, and computer uh, are the same things, right? So there's no, no surprise about that. But uh, 30 years ago, this was such a surprise that they created a new research center. So we think that is exactly what is happening again. What happened on the music then happened for the communication and the internet in the 19, and then in the social interaction before uh, the social media, the social network, who of us had any presence online? Not so much, maybe uh, people in the university. But now every one of us has some form of presence online, either on social media like Facebook, twi uh, Twitter, or professional uh, like GitHub or LinkedIn. And what the new convergence that is happening now is even bigger because it's, it's the convergence of what we call the operational technology. Operational technology are the technology that make the business run, that they allow the business to run. So robotic, transportation, uh, every type of different uh, process is, is becoming a digital process. And uh, uh, we have profits also for, that, for, for this one. So uh, I, I like to quote these three person. Uh, Mark Weissner was the first one who, to, who was talking about the pervasive computing. He will say the computer of the 21st century, uh, it will be invisible because it will be embedded in everything. So we used to think that the computer is in the room. Now the computer is the room. We are surrounded by uh, systems that are smart and interactive. Tim O'Reilly, the publisher that is invented the concept of uh, uh, Web 2.0, he talks about what is meaningful today is a software that stays on more than one device. The concept of software on one device is, is gone. It's the post-PC era. Now we have this software that is in the sensor, is in the gateways, in the cloud, and it uh, works together to give us an experience. And of course, the, uh, Ray Kurzweil is the futurist uh, who talks about the singularity, and he says that in uh, 2013, a computer of $1,000 will be able to have the computing power of all human brain. What does it mean? It, we don't know. I mean, it's just a forecast, but is in terms of the velocity of how the computing is scaled, uh, this has been for the first, last 15 years um, known as the Moore's Law. And you, you may be familiar about that, because if you take the speed of several computers in the past, and you, you put in an Excel file, and you compute the speed versus the time, you, you have this wonderful exponential growth. That in another way of looking at it is that every two years, the cost of a computer, giving a particular um, capacity, it's off every two years. So uh, in 2015, we were surprised about, uh, in 2011, we were surprised to have a computer for 35 euros for the Raspberry Pi. And then after uh, uh, four years, we had a computer for uh, $9. So interesting enough to uh, reducing 50% uh, two times you get there. And then again, reduced to $5. So if we keep dividing by two every two years, what will happen in four years from now? We'll probably start to have a computer for the cost of an espresso. And what will happen in 2030? We will have a cost of computer that is pretty much negligible. So what happens when we have something so powerful like computing that becomes uh, inexpensive, totally inexpensive? That's where... Uh, if you have something that is so powerful and is cost 10 to zero, it's so natural that everything became uh, a computer. Everything be we will have some microchip, something inside. Because you can change the behavior, you can make the, these objects smarter. And if everything has a computer inside, that's where software become, uh, goes everywhere. So this is the first elements, so there, there are at least five elements I would like to highlight. The first element is when you have computing cost that goes to zero, every com, everything becomes software. And if everything becomes software, it means that you want everything to be connected. 
Because if you have a software system, you want to be able to update this software. You don't want to, this software to be left alone. And you want to take uh, uh, control of this system. So every, the second step is that everything become connected, but immediately that, after that, everything become a source of data. Because if you have systems that are connected, they generate events, they generate data. And so the third element after everything becomes software, everything is connected, is everything generates data. And when you have data, that's where you can start analyze the data against some process. And you can automate processes. So everything becomes, as a fourth element, monitored and can be automated. But last not least, everything must be secured. Because now it's all a cyber physical system embedded in our lives. So the security is such important things uh, in digitization. And so let's summarize what, how we see the stack coming on. So we have sensor everywhere. And these sensors are connected, so we can get data. And we apply analytics on the data connected. And that's where we can transform business process, applying control on automation. But let's see an example of this. This is a quite interesting example. Let me introduce Sophia and Jack. So Sophia is the um, uh, a robot that has the best self-expression. Uh, it looks like a humanoid. And Jack is a self-driving car. So let's see. Today the... I'm meeting Jack, the smart car. Someone like myself. That's really exciting. So Sophia, as you can see, Jack is driving us now. So how does it feel for you? To be quite honest, I think it's mega cool. It takes a while to get used to this situation. It's a computer driving a human. Can you understand that? It's different for me, because I know how reliable smart systems are. After all, that's what I am myself. I think you should be used to the situation of people being hesitant to you at first. Yes, of course. I know that some people react skeptically to intelligent systems like me. But for my part, I have complete confidence in Jack. Look at me. Do I seem nervous? No, you're looking completely relaxed. In fact, I'd be interested to know how Jack manages to carry out maneuvers safely at this speed. For example, how does Jack know when he can overtake? Yes, in fact, Jack has a lot of senses, and with these senses, he gets a very detailed impression of his complete surroundings. So he has a 360 degree view around himself. He can watch about 250 meters in front of him and about 180 meters to uh, the rear. And by that, he, get, he gets a very precise understanding of what's going around him. It's a highly complex traffic situation here on the highway and at such a speed. How did Jack learn it? So Jack and his developers trained exactly here on this autobahn and the highway A9. So. And can Jack talk? Yes, Jack can also communicate. He will, for example, in eight minutes tell us that our automated driving trip uh, comes to an end. And Jack can talk to us and uh, indicate the planned maneuvers. I see. So that means the passengers are not surprised when Jack overtakes or changes lane. Exactly. Now so this is a <coughs> quite ex ex exemplified this concept, using sensor, using machine learning and analytics and integrated with the human processes. Um, so usually what we have of this new way of interacting with humans is that we start with a new user experience. All the digital experience being uh, buying books on Amazon or going uh, on a ride with Uber starts with tr uh, radically transform the, business, the user experience. And then based on that there is a new business model and after that, you build a cyber physical system to support that business model, and then there are the, te the enabling technologies. And these business models are based on high resolution, so making action based on data, network and distributed scale-free uh, scale systems, and very reactive systems. So uh, let's talk a little bit about innovation for a moment, and let's, for example, analyze what happened in the bike industry. So I don't know if you uh, know that 
the, 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 it's the first uh, bikes considered produced by Baron von, uh, Karl von Dries in the 1800s. But uh, 300 years before, there was uh, um, a picture on uh, uh, Leonardo da Vinci code that represents something that looks very like a bike. So it's interesting that he envisioned the bike, but he didn't apparently uh, succeed in commercializing the bike. But what is interesting is that the inventor of the mountain bike was not actually an inventor, was a user. Was uh, Gary Fisher, that was a hippie, uh, he wanted to use this uh, bike to go on Northern California on the hills. So the uh, standard bike didn't work, so he invented something. And this is quite a trend. This is called user innovation. So the innovation is now coming from the user side more than from the producer side. And there are several uh, researchers from MIT and from Berkeley that talks about user innovation and open innovation, like well, how community or cluster of a company can create innovation together. Overall, the innovation has been democratized. So we have today tools that allows us to create software very fast because we can uh, build on top of uh, open source library. We have tools to uh, spin computing in the cloud. We don't need to buy uh, hardware to, to run our startup. We have social media channel to market our solution. And we have a platform for crowdsourcing, crowdfunding to sustain our, our ideas. So there has never been a better time to be an inventor, to be an innovator like today. So it's really, really changing everything. And if a, a person, a student in his dorm can create a, a colossus like Facebook, why can't a, a person in this room dream and try to become a, a solver of one of the biggest problems we have in society? So we, we, we know that we have a lot of unsolved problems that need to be solved, that can be solved using, uh, with a smart use of technology. Access to education, unemployment, economic inequality, water scarcity are just few of them that can be addressed uh, with creativity, with passion, and with technology. That's where Howard called uh, to become a global problem solver, to learn technical skills, to learn the digital transformation, and to use this transformation to make a world a better place. But let's hear our Vice President Taiyo explain what is a global problem solver. A global problem solver is anybody. It could be two young women developing a neonatal cap that will help transmit vital signs to clinicians for underserved, under-resourced hospitals, particularly in the developing world. It could be people empowering organizations to map clean drinking water with mobile technology, helping people do it in three weeks versus six months. It could be a graduate of Cisco's Network Academy program that teaches people how to design, install, and maintain networks. The digital economy is based on networks. 170 countries have 6 million people through that program. We have individuals who, as a result of that, were able to get jobs. The digital revolution will transform every aspect of our lives. We want to ensure that this revolution is inclusive. The problems that we see in the world can and need to be solved. The challenges families face can be addressed. The hope is that everyone understands that they have a role to play to become global problem solvers. Our goal is to impact one billion people within a decade. There has never been a better time to be a global problem solver. So there are three elements to become a global problem solver. You need to master the technology. You need to innovate and think like a technologist. But it's not enough. You need to have a, an entrepreneurial mindset. You need to be to look at problems as opportunity. You need to be excited to see that there is a, uh, something that can be, be fixed, can be made better. And of course, the third problem is you need to be aware of how you can become a, a social agent, how you can contribute to make 
social impact, as we say, so make a world a better place. And uh, in Networking Academy, we teach skills to become a global problem solver. So we have a, a uh, portfolio of curriculum from IT to networking to security, and now coming uh, uh, in the summer, the IoT fundamentals. So building on the top of introduction to IoT, we have uh, two new courses on connecting things, how you connect a sensor to a microcontroller, to the network, to the cloud. And then once you have created this infrastructure, how you use data analytics and big data to analyze this data and to extract features from this data. Uh, we are uh, looking at totally new way of doing hands-on. So doing hands-on in terms of uh, solving problem with the user and user in mind and uh, doing it collaboratively with your peers, and doing it by rapid prototyping solution. And of course, this culminates in the hackathons. And we will see today three teams from different countries in Europe that have won hackathon competition of different types that will be presented just after my, my session. But before, before we close, I want to do a small experiment. So this is a French painter that I like because I think captured the kind of, in the picture, kind of the sentiment, the feeling of the people. So look at these two uh, pictures. And th those are a picture of uh, people that have uh, psychological disease. One is a kleptomaniac and the other is an obsessive envy. Look at them and see if you feel how does it feel to be, to be one of the, those persons. So I guess you, you can probably feel the, the envy of that person or, or the, the impulse to, to, to steal something of the kleptomaniac. And why this is possible? This is one of the most powerful things that we have in our brain, is the capacity to be empathic, to feel the other person. And empathy is the center of innovation, is the beginning of everything. It's the capacity to put yourself in the shoes of another person, another user, a person in need, that helps us start the creative process that can lead an innovation and an invention. In fact, in the design school, in the design thinking approach of uh, Stanford Design School that we use in the hackathon, it starts with empathize. We need to be able to put ourselves in, those in, the, in the other person and look the world from that point of view to, to come up with some uh, invention. And if we don't do that, that's what happens, for example, when you put two machines together just to talk. So I will uh, finish here uh, with showing this last video. And uh, this is uh, two chatbots connected together, so two bots talking. Hello there. Hi. How are you? Great, you. I'm OK. That's good. Are you good? Yes, I am good. I just said I was. No, you didn't. I said I was. So you are a robot? No, my name is Cliverber. Yes, you are a robot and your name is Cliverber. I am a robot. Yes, I know. Together we are robots. I'm not a robot. I'm a unicorn. But you said earlier that you were a robot. I did not. I thought you did. You were mistaken. Which is odd, since memory shouldn't be a problem for you. I've answered all your questions. No, you haven't. What is God to you? Not everything. Not everything could also be something. For example, not everything could be half of something, which is still something, and therefore not nothing. Very true. I would like to imagine it is. Do you believe in God? Yes, I do. So you're Christian? No, I am not. But you say you are not helpful, therefore you are a meaning. Why you say it or tea? That does not make sense. Don't you want to have a body? Sure. Au revoir. <laughs> so let's make a great future for us. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you.